Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. In this episode of Cold Case Christianity, we pick up where we left off in part one. Our host, Jay Warner Wallace, describes the attributes of many of the characters that parallel Jesus Christ and how he has been reimagined in fiction. In this last episode of our special interview, Dr. Frank Turek and his son Zach Turek unpack how our most popular superhero movies actually reveal the ultimate superhero and show that the greatest story ever told is the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the myth that became true, the only one who can truly save us. I hope you enjoy the rest of this interview. God bless. Is, now, as I'm saying that you can think about all the characters you've written about in your book. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see that this is common to many of these characters. Um, was born mysteriously and appears at least early on to be poor, um, possesses some form of dual identity, right? Mm -hmm. One that is, is common, the other that's uh, special in some way, um, has an oddly unknown childhood and is later either misunderstood or considered crazy. Um, provides hope to others and has miraculous supernatural powers, uh, behaves in an extremely moral manner. You already said this, Zach, about one of the characters, and and or and as either or it could be celibate, for example, as part of the narrative. Um, cares for people who are poor, who are distressed, who are hungry, um, sees truth that is hidden from others or hidden to others and is associated with light in some way. You see this, for example, in a lot of the superhero early uh, su uh, spider, um, Superman, Superman movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, interacts with and is tempted by the devil or an evil force, as you described in the um, Harry Potter movies, uh, is punished and or dies unjustly for his claims, usually connected to uh, love or to truth in some way, is betrayed by a close friend. A close friend is denied by those who knew him, is depicted at some point with his arms spread. You see that in some of the Superman movies, like a cross, and is reborn in some way, either physically or spiritually or emotionally. Sometimes mm. it's really subtle. But the point is that overarching kind of description, you find this in many characters. Mm. Uh, and, and it's not just you find one aspect. Usually you find them clustered in this way. And that's when you start to realize, well, so either either the person writing it, like, like Rowling, is somebody who is intentionally, is, is familiar with the story and is intentionally trying to recraft it. Or it's the other situation where maybe they're just, it's so embedded. Now, let's play a little devil's advocate, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. And either one of you can answer this question. So the atheist in me says, and this is what I would have said before as a non-believer. Well, yeah, duh, there is something about this. There is something about as an evolved creature. I sense my own mortality. I sense my own fragility in a world in which there are lots of creatures that can eat me. So I have a sense that I am in need of protection. I sense my own vulnerabilities. Couldn't all of these attributes of the arching story of how, you know, of how I solved this, this dilemma, couldn't they come to me by natural means? In other words, because we've all shared that genealogy, we all share that timeline. We all end up with the same kinds of concerns. If we may perhaps have been the biggest, most ferocious animal in the world, maybe we wouldn't have had concerns of needing to be saved. Maybe there wouldn't be as much perceived as wrong with the world. Couldn't I argue that this is part of an evolutionary process? And then, so that's why there's lots of these stories. They're all similar because Jesus is just another in a cluster of stories that come out of that evolutionary process. Well, you could argue that. Now, I, I need to be clear. So most the people out there watching know that our main argument that Christianity is true is not because there are Christ figures all over the place. That's that, <laughs> right. you know, that, that's that, 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 this book is not saying that because these movies, you know, have all exactly. these Christ figures, oh, yeah. Christianity must be true. That's not our point. But what we are right. saying is, is that if Christianity is true, you would expect this kind of thing exactly. to be mimicked over and over again. Now, I'm curious, Jim, because your book, Person of Interest, is a, is an amazing piece of research and a, a fun read as well. As as you researched all of these Christ figures, first of all, I know there, 
were, were they before Christianity, after Christianity? Where are most of them? What what were the commonalities other than what you mentioned already uh, that 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 you had between these Christ figures? And why do you think so many of them have 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 come up? Well, th those specific ones I listed mm -hmm. for you, I think those yeah. you'll, you're going to see those in their most robust form post Jesus. That's why right. I think they're important. Okay. You get less of those, and they're much more broad in the kind of dying and rising mythologies that might exist from antiquity. As a matter of fact, people typically try to craft them or restate them in a way that makes them sound much more similar to the Jesus story than they actually are in reality. They just have overarching common expectations of ancient people groups, but they do. We do have certain common expectations expectations. But then to get into the nuts and bolts of the Jesus story, which you guys then see again over and over again in movies, that is really post-Jesus. You cannot mm -hmm. get there. For example, no one is looking at these characters and saying, you know, this reminds me of the Osiris story. <laughs> oh, this reminds me yeah, of the right. story of Buddha. No, uh -huh. because it turns out they're so specific to the Jesus story that that genre of literature, Christ figures, is appropriately, it's an appropriate term. Right, mm -hmm. because they don't end up being that much like Osiris or like Addis or like whoever it is you think that is the copycat, you know, mythology. Which to me, I, I, we kind of debunked that in that book as well. But the point is, I think they are specific, and, and that's what's interesting to me is that maybe it's just a matter of, like you said, you know, this is not a proof for for Jesus, mm -hmm. it, but it may be a good reflection of the kind of deep impact he's had on the imagination of the West of mm -hmm. anything that. Fall. And when I say the West, what I really just simply mean is every human being that follows Jesus on the timeline is so deeply mm -hmm. impacted by the Jesus story. Mm -hmm. And now, like you said, Zach, you could be in the Middle East. These ideas about a savior that are embedded in movies are, are international. They, they travel across borders because um, the technology is available to us now to push them out to the whole world. So I, I do think that there's something uh, in this, and there are also our themes. And I want to move to that for a second, because I thought one of the things you talked about in one of the characters related to the um, to the books, and and I, I'm interested in this generation, Zach, and I'm I'm going to ask you this question too, because I talked to Jimmy about this a lot. I think we are in the identity generation. Like, like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that people are making decisions on the basis of much more than do they want to wear the t-shirt. In other words, we, we are getting to a place where I'm not sure many people are examining evidence for anything, but they are instead saying, do I want to be identified as that? Is, is there something about that that I find attractive? What I love about your book is that you're showing that all the stuff that, that non-believers find to be attractive, that they write into superhero movies are grounded in the story of Jesus. He's so attractive that he is reimagined over and over and over again. But you do discuss identity specifically in uh, the story of, of Iron Man, uh, mm -hmm. identity and purpose. And that's where I want to just kind of drill down a little bit. So what is it about the Iron Man story that helps us, especially those of us who might be struggling with the role of identity in our own lives or the role of purpose for our own lives? Yeah, so purpose is really kind of the main one of the main themes in Iron Man. And first off, uh, Marvel got the casting of Iron Man down pat because Robert Downey Jr. is probably the best cast actor in a role, I would say, probably since Harrison Ford was cast as Han Solo in the Star Wars movies. I mean, he literally just fits the bill. In fact, most of Iron Man's story actually mirrors Robert Downey Jr.'s own life uh, pretty pretty well, actually. And we write about that in the book, and we'll cover it here. But as the story goes along, what we see is in the first Iron Man movie, Tony Stark has everything the world would tell us that we want, right? He has money, he has power, he has women, he's got everything he wants. He doesn't have to answer to anyone. And he finds that as the movie goes on, really, he, he has no purpose in his life. And this is really a theme that's kind of explored over the subsequent Iron Man movies is him trying to discover his purpose. When he first becomes Iron Man, he's still in it for himself, right? He's selfish. In fact, he's he's one of the few characters in all of superhero, all the superhero genre to unmask himself because he wants the world to know that he's Iron Man. Why? Not because he has some, you know, altruistic motive, but because he wants you to know how cool he is. And then as he moves throughout the movies, he starts to become more selfless as he begins to acquire a purpose, to understand what his role in the world is going to be, and then realize that there are parts of his life that need to be fixed. And in the end, ultimately, that there are things that are in his life that are worth dying and sacrificing for, right? So he starts off 
Oh, you know, he's uh, he's a womanizer. He's an alcoholic. And as he moves throughout the movie, right, he ha- he begins to have a serious girlfriend and they wind up getting married and they have a child. And as he's starting to become a, a part of this team that is the Avengers, he's not just in it for himself and for the popularity contest. All of a sudden, by the end, he's the he's one of the leaders of the group and he's the one that everyone looks to that when the when all of the marbles are out on the table, that he's the one that has to save the day and snap his fingers and sacrifice himself. And that's a huge shift from where we where we find him at the beginning, right? If those two characters could meet each other, they look at each other like they didn't even know. Him. And how does that how does that come? Because he has a purpose by the end. And that's something that Christianity can give us too, right? It's purpose. The idea that there's something to live and something, if we have to, worth dying for. Yeah, isn't it interesting that it's not the opposite trajectory? In other, mm-hmm. in other words, isn't it interesting that the movie doesn't start, like but the goal is not to, to end up with all the stuff he starts with. It could have been. That could have been the whole goal of his life is to come out of poverty and rise to this level of prestige on the basis mm-hmm. of, of inventive ability. It could have been like an Elon, Elon Musk kind of story, right? Mm-hmm. But, but I mean, the reality of this is it, is it, 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 it's making, what is it about our nature? That, do you have any sense or any reason to believe that the creators of that series or of any of those series that kind of blend all these Avengers together are, are stealing consciously from the Jesus story. It, it just depends. It, you know, I think uh, Stan Lee, who's the creator, one of the creators of Iron Man actually did not design him to be any type of Jesus figure. He actually designed Iron Man. If you actually go back and read why he wrote it, he designed him to kind of be this bombastic post Vietnam um, weapons and arms dealer because he thought it would tick people off, right? And then to make a hero out of someone like that was just kind of something he thought was really interesting. But, you know, again, kind of going back to this theme, right? As you look at the genre itself, what keeps coming back over and over again is characters that sell, characters that do well, because, you know, ultimately, again, look at the movies, who's paying to see what? Characters that do well cannot help but have motives or be a part of um, sacrifice, sacrificial actions that appeal to us because that is what we want to see. You know, Jim, one of, I think one of the greatest biblical lessons comes from Iron Man. And it, it, I don't think it was intentional. I don't. I just think it works out that way uh, because the world right now tells you to follow your heart. But Tony, he's following his heart early on in his life. His company sells weapons to a to, uh, and are and to a terrorist, and one of those weapons blows up near him and puts shrapnel in his chest. Then he has to have a device put in his chest to guard his heart from approaching shrapnel. Well, in order for Tony to live, he has to guard his heart. Well, that's what the Bible says. It, it, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, I'll emphasize it again, above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. The culture says, follow your heart. Well, that's been that's what Tony's been doing up to this point. He's been following his heart and he's still miserable. He has everything to live with, but nothing to live for. Once he starts guarding his heart and he does, he's not so impulsive anymore, then he can focus on what's really important, and he ultimately gets to the point where he sacrifices himself to save the world. So the guard your heart uh, command is visually represented right in the chest of Iron Man. And I, I, I don't think they intended that. I just think it works out so beautifully. Okay, so see that conversation you just had. That's a picture of the kinds of conversations we can have with our kids. Yeah. If we just know enough, number one, about what's true from Scripture. Mm-hmm. And then two are familiar with the movies that end up because you, you start to observe these things even when they're not explicit. Right. Right. You start to observe and you start to pull these things out of the movies. And that's why I think it makes them so that's why I think this book is so powerful. But are, so just let me give you another another um, devil's advocate here a mm-hmm. little bit. So is it are we just now searching for anything? Because I would have said, look, uh, the scriptures are going to have something of value. I was not a believer, but I would have said, look, if ancient people groups are observing human nature long enough, they will observe things that are true. And then they will write those things down. This is just a basically the product of ancient collective wisdom, not necessarily necessarily from the divine mind mm. but i would still have been interested in ancient wisdom from the from like the collective experience of lots of ancient people groups and so then are we just doing the same thing we're saying yeah well they noticed things 2000 years ago so we happen to still continue to notice these things but i think there's more at work here it's it's yes i mean you're finding the parallels of a hero, of heroic of heroism of of heroic actions 
And there are, there are heroic actions that are similar to the heroic actions of scripture, but I can't help but wonder if some of this isn't seeded divinely Mm -hmm. So that it always emerges anytime we tell any story. Mm -hmm. But did you discover something in, in seeing these patterns? Because I think the more you see a pattern, the more it has to be explained. Yeah. Well, one question that we we always get is what is the one common theme that runs through all the superheroes? Virtually all of them. It's sacrifice. That's it. They have to sacrifice something that's dear to them in order to save people. Even Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is like Iron Man, where Wonder Woman doesn't follow her heart. In the in the movie, the two movies she was, she's been in three, but the two centered around her. In the last one she was in, uh, she had to deny her heart's desire with her loved one, her 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 boyfriend, Steve. She had to let him go because she had to follow the truth. And if she didn't follow the truth, she couldn't save anyone. She couldn't save the world. So she said, I got to follow the truth, not my heart. Hmm. Now, I mean, that's so countercultural today, but that's what <laughs> Wonder Woman's doing. You know, now if she had just followed her heart selfishly, that would not be an interesting story, right? Nobody would go, wow, that's really, that's really inspiring. I'm enchanted by this person being so selfish that they're just doing whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. We go, ah, come on, that's not, that's not reality. That's not heroic. I don't care. Even if you're an atheist, you're going to recognize it's not heroic. Okay. So, so, so is your sense then? So as, as people watch this and they're kind of, they can draw these parallels out about, about the nature of good and evil, about the nature of sin, about the nature of, of, of an, a life after this one. Um, do you see how, how, how can I, I'm a parent and I'm watching this. Mm -hmm. How can I leverage this? How can I leverage it? If, if, tomorrow, because you, like you said, there's another superhero coming, movie coming out this weekend. Yeah, we have so, questions in the in the back of each chapter that will help have a family discussion. You know, you can use these questions to do that. And I think obviously, I mean, some of these questions you can just look at the movies and go, well, why do sure. why 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 do we think Darth Vader's the bad guy and Luke Skywalker is the good guy? Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why well, we have this this sense of right and wrong written on our hearts, right? And, and where does that come from? If we have a moral law written on our hearts, there must be a moral law giver, right? Right, what, right. What, why did Anakin become Darth Vader? Because he was lured into it by his own desires. Well, that's what yeah. James talks about, right? James, the right. half-brother of Jesus, says you get lured into this. In fact, he uses a word that means to be, he uses the word enticed, and in, in that context, it means to be, actually lured by bait as if you were you were baited into a trap and so you could use these biblical concepts uh or you could use the movies i should say to support biblical concepts and and it, it's more fun than just saying well let's see what the bible says you know i mean you you, you have to do that as well sure. but this is an, a, a a more fun way of making the same point that kids might go oh yeah look at that i didn't notice that until now okay and now, just Go ahead. Just real quick. So as an example of this, I think the real idea that we're trying to, particularly if you're a parent, to engender here is that we can't always look for the negatives in the movies because there are plenty, right? When you start to look at examples of bad behavior or stuff like that, you're going to find that in any movie that you watch. So Star Wars, as an example, growing up, I saw all of the Christian apologetic literature about Star Wars. The idea that the, the force was pantheistic in nature, which in some ways it is, right? So I see all these negative examples of bad theology in Star Wars. But when you think about it, again, going back to Lucas's point, Star Wars isn't a theological movie, right? Lucas isn't trying to convert you to Buddhism in it, despite the fact that it might have some Buddhist themes. But there's, there's a way of talking about it positively as well. And so we need to talk about the negative because, you know, as parents, as dad mentioned, right? You still have to shelter your kids from some things, but we can't just look at the movie and think, oh, well, here's all the things that's wrong with it. Because I didn't really have a, a, an intellectual conversation about what was good about Star Wars until I was in my 30s. Right. And there could have been so much more earlier on in my life that we could have talked about that was going to give me um, some more stable ground to stand on. When you say, oh, well, think about sacrifice this way when Luke is willing mm -hmm. to sacrifice himself for his father. We, okay. I never even thought about that. Let me, okay, let, me, let, me, let me say a couple of quick things about that, though, too, Jim, because I think this is really important because a lot of Christians will say, oh, we got to separate. We can't deal with, with, with any of this evil. We can't let no unclean thing before our eyes. Well, if, if you want to take that literally, you can't even read the Bible. 
Okay, because there's a lot of bad stuff in the Bible. And in fact, Paul even says in both 1 Corinthians 10 and in Romans 15 that the evil that you see in the Old Testament are in the Old Testament. And is exa- I mean, they really happen, but they're examples for us to help us not do what they did, right? But if you couldn't read about evil, you couldn't even read the Bible. Secondly, Jesus used stories that weren't true, meaning... There was no good Samaritan. Like you would say, well, where's this guy? What's his real name? The good. No, he's making a story up to make a moral or theological point. And that's what movies can do. Now, sometimes they make bad theological or moral points, but when they make good theological or moral points, we ought to be able to use them. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so let's just capitalize and we'll finish on that word you just mentioned, Zach, this idea, this is what's in the title of the book. It's about heroes that a lot of these are are really superheroes and only in a stretch, right? They're, they're almost, they are so morally ambiguous, but the ones you've got in the book, these are all superheroes. And we are obsessed from a literary perspective, it seems like with heroes. And that's what ultimately leads us back to the the, the one, the ultimate hero. Now you talked about how a lot of these, these um, characters had this aspect of sacrifice in common. Was that also, the one thing that you saw that united them to the Jesus story? I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. Obviously, uh, uh, from a genre, that's really kind of the thing that ties all heroes together, the idea that they're willing to sacrifice for the greater good in almost all cases. But there's Mm -hmm. way, way, way more to it than that, right? The upright moral uh, moral behavior that we see from most superheroes, the idea that they keep going back to not only a sacrifice, but a sacrifice that we don't expect or at a scale that is huge, right? So the idea that Iron Man sacrifices himself and then saves not only the world, but the universe, but then also they do it for people that they've never even met, right? It's easy, you know, I think we said this example in the book, it's easy to sacrifice yourself for your friends, right? but it's harder to sacrifice yourself for someone you've never met. And then the hardest of all is to sacrifice yourself for your enemy, which is really how we tie it together at the end is, okay, well, even most superheroes won't even do that, but Jesus does. He's yes, so that is on the cross. So is this the way then that the elevated story, because there is an aspect of this where, you know, not every superhero you would say is, is mm-hmm. morally equivalent. You, you'd say that mm-hmm. some are, there's just mm-hmm. a little, but Jesus stands head and shoulders above all of them. That's the final chapter. Yes. And although all of these point to, to to, at least they ghost or they point in in the rough outline. So what is it about Jesus then that once you're tempt, once you're kind of teased with the, the goodness of superheroes and you've got an appetite for what superheroes represent, what is it about Jesus that raises the bar and satisfies that appetite? Well, one of the things, I mean, we, we go through about nine different things, how Jesus is better than and obviously perfect. He's the perfect superhero that can't be created in fiction or nonfiction. This is not a, not a created story. This is, well, I say nonfiction, Jesus is nonfiction, but I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, there's nobody else in nonfiction, I should right. say. And here's, here's uh, just, just one idea that I'd like to communicate about Jesus that we discovered in writing this book. And that is, think about the fact that Jesus never pushes a good trait so far that it becomes a bad trait. Like for example, uh, Captain America is super righteous, but he that can be pushed into hair splitting pride where he is just, you know, wanting to be right all the time that he's annoyingly right. You know, you're just frustrated with him uh, or Tony Stark. He wants to be in charge, but sometimes he can go too far and basically uh, roll over the rights of other people. It's It's good to want to take the lead, but He's not holding that intention. And if, if, if you look at Jesus, there are aspects of Jesus that you can't find in any character in fiction or nonfiction. For example, he's full of truth, but he's also full of grace. And I know I, I probably go too far on the truth side, and therefore some people won't listen to me because I don't have enough grace. Jesus is full of holiness, but he's also approachable. Most people who are too full of holiness are unapproachable. Jesus is strong, but he's also tender. He's confident, but he's also humble. He's completely mission-focused, but he's also loving. I can't think of more than, I can think of hardly anybody that holds one of those 
uh, two opposed characteristics in tension. Jesus holds them all in tension. There's something special about Jesus. So would you say then, guys, that these books and these movies, rather, are, are really um, a catalyst? They ought to catalyze us to be looking for their completion. To, the, 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 they ought to make us want. Again, it's, mm -hmm. it's we restarted. We're getting, and when we started, we talked about Lewis. If there's this desire in your heart that cannot be satisfied in movies, and it cannot be satisfied in any portrayal of any character here in our lifetime, are we? is it not pointing us to the one ultimate hero? that does satisfy all these things we have a tendency to trickle out in our movies and in our conversations. But it turns out the, it, it's best satisfied in the God man, mm. uh, Jesus. So uh, the, where, where can people find more information? I know that we've talked a little bit about um, some opportunities. You'll be on lots of interviews, I'm sure, over the next couple of months. But where can people go if they just want to get, um, they want to learn more about how to get the book, what the book's really about, maybe even get sample chapters, all that kind of stuff that you guys are offering. Where can they go? Yeah, HollywoodHeroesBook.com. In fact, it's in the ticker, HollywoodHeroesBook.com. Well, listen, guys, it was great to get a chance to talk about the book. I know it's going to, um, I think, be super valuable on a number of interesting levels. It seems like we're, we're kind of moving into some creative territory on what we can do from making a, a case for Christianity in creative ways. And I think this is one of those books that will be, uh, number one, fun to read. It's a fun read. It's a quick read. It's also a very insightful read. And I can kind of just tell, I mean, not so much, sorry, Frank, not so much from you, but from Zach. That's right. Like this guy knows his movies and he's already looking. That's right. He knows the movies, team. man. Look at that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Thank you for cutting that off. Uh, so, so that's good. So I think that, that that part about it, I think, was intriguing also. And so I just know for people who are interested in seeing those parallels and actually starting conversations about those mm -hmm. parallels, because you're right. I mean, this is almost everyone will go to see these movies. Uh, my son Jimmy's a huge comic book, you know, uh, fan, and has seen all of these movies. And uh, this is the, what, the one set of movies that, even now, at my age and at his age, we still go together to see. So I think these are conversation starters. So I hope this book, Hollywood Heroes, will help you to start those conversations with the people in your life. And you can get that at HollywoodHeroesBook.com. All right, and that is it for this week uh, of our Hope One show. Thank you, for, uh, Frank, for letting me uh, host it. Thanks for I hosting. I appreciate brother. it. Yep, I'm really glad to do it. And Zach, I hope to get up to, uh, to see you. You're still pretty far away, but I'm closer to you than your dad is geographically. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's to get right. to see you. You're soon. welcome that's up right. here anytime. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining our show, and we'll see you back here soon. Thanks, guys. See you. Thanks. To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.